Oh, I think it's just a liberal conservative difference. I, I don't think these uh, uh, comprehensive constitutional theories are <laughs> worth the paper they're written on. Um, I, I don't think there's any content to those, uh, to originalism, active liberty, any of that stuff. It's liberals and conservatives. In the example I like to give, there's a Jewish joke. It's not, I think, too uh, improper for television. So person in, you know, Minsk or something, or Pinsk, is walking down the street and he sees that the, um, that the moil, so the moil is the person who in uh, traditional Judaism performs ritual circumcisions, right, on babies. So the moil has a, an office, place of business, and the, this passerby notices that in the, the window of the moil's little shop, uh, is a display of pocket watches. And he walks in and he says, Moyle, what, what is going on? You're displaying pocket watches in, in your window. And you're a, you're a Moyle, you're not, a, you're not a, a seller of watches. So the Moyle's response is, what do you want me to exhibit in my window, right? So that's my reaction to these uh, fancy theories about the Constitution. You, you, the judges are not going to say, well, the reason that I am for abortion or against abortion rights or something is I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative or I'm Catholic or I'm a secular Jew, whatever it is. They don't say that, right? <laughs> can't say that. So instead they construct some elaborate rationalization. But I, I really do think, I, um, I have a book coming out uh, in the spring called How Judges Think. And I discuss this issue of comprehensive constitutional theories at some length. I discuss Justice Breyer's book, and I discuss, you know, um, Justice Scalia's and others' views, opposite views, as you, as you mentioned. And I, I don't think there's anything in those. Uh, I think these guys uh, have feelings, you know, political feelings, moral feelings, emotional feelings about these cases, and they dress up their feelings in a, in a, in a, a elaborate way. One of the things that bothers me about the judging business generally is that the judge. I hope I'm not guilty of this, but the judges tend to um, conceal in their opinions and also often their public statements what is actually um, important in, in in a case. And they, uh, you know, they talk about history. They talk about the plain meaning of statutory language, but really it's not that. It's something more basic. It's not always basely political or anything like that. It may just be a sense that, you know, this particular decision doesn't make any sense. It's going to produce too many cases. It's going to uh, encourage uh, uh, socially unproductive behavior and so on. So, um, So if you go back, one of the early sex cases, kind of antecedent of Roe versus Wade, was a case called Griswold versus Connecticut in the early 1960s. And the question was the constitutionality of a, of a Connecticut law that um, forbade the sale of contraceptives, even to a married couple. And the Supreme Court held it was unconstitutional. And there's a lot of talk in various judicial opinions and then later commentary about, you know, right of privacy and where is it in the Constitution and this or that. All very semantic. Well, what the case came down to, it seems to me, is that um, uh, the, the, law was not, the law was not enforced in the sense that, first of all, Condoms, because they also are, uh, you know, prophylactic against against uh, venereal disease, could be freely sold. So that's a huge gap. That's the first thing. But the major consequence of the law was that you couldn't have birth control clinics in Connecticut because that was so obvious a flouting of the law that it would be it would be uh, enjoined or the operators prosecute. On the other hand, 
if you went to a gynecologist, he could prescribe, uh, you know, a diaphragm or something. That would, that would no problem. There's no enforcement against that. What that meant was that middle class people could get whatever contraceptive assistance they wanted. But lower class people who would go to clinics but didn't have their own gynecologist or anything, they wouldn't have access to any contraceptives except condoms. So that was the real uh, injustice of the law. I want to talk in those terms. It had a, it had a disproportionate effect on uh, poorer people. That was wrong. Now, that's the essential point, which is not made in any of the judicial opinions. Now, then the question is, is, is the fact that this is an offensive law, what, what, how, how germane is that? Or what, what of the fact that, that the only reason for the law is, is, the, is the large Catholic population in Connecticut? Because no one else, this was before the rise of evangelical Christians. And the evangelical Christians don't object to contraception, they object to abortion. Only the Catholic Church, as far as I know, among major religions, believes that contraception is wrong. Uh, artificial contraception as opposed to, you know, the rhythm method. So, so you have a, a law that's, you know, really sectarian, really procured by a religious group for sec sectarian reasons. And you have, and it, the law bears uh, harshly on the poor part of the population. Um, so those are the essential. Right? You fit that into a constitution. There's nothing in the constitution that seems to bear on issues of that sort. But you can make a leap and say, you know, the concept of liberty in the due process clause, Fourteenth Amendment, can encompass sexual liberty, some dimension of sexual liberty, and this is an unreasonable uh, restraint. You could write an opinion like that, which would have been a lot more straightforward than. Uh, what not only the justices, but you know, forty odd years of commentary on this case has uh, has 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 um, the terms in which it's been discussed. <laughs>